Welcome everyone. In this session, we will discuss how to future-proof the built environment. With rising energy bills and extreme weather conditions um, caused by climate change, we will be discussing how to retrofit fit our homes, offices, and apartments to save and generate electricity and become more resilient. We'll also talk about how technology and innovation can help us create smart homes that help us live more sustainably. And we will also talk about how to ensure long-term thinking to meet future needs and changing consumer behaviors. Let's meet our panelists. Our first panel, she's the co-founder of Axelot, architects with an expertise in sustainable solutions and circular design. Welcome, Maria Axelson. Thank you for having me. Should we take a look at some of your projects and designs? Sure. Well, we do have a uh, sustainability ambition with our project. Um, so we work often with trying to limit the carbon footprints of the project by, for instance, building in solid wood. And this is a housing project in Uppsala with 120 apartments or something like this. And work also um, with integrating social sustainability and overlaying that with green structure. And um, for instance, if we are able to, we work we like to create social space on rooftops with um, um, outdoor kitchens and overlaying that with green structure where the people living in the house. We um, look at the built environment and uh, uh, try to retrofit these buildings and um, often add on to the roof rooftop. And as we do so, we consider how to limit the energy consumption in the building um, for instance, we plant meadows on the rooftops uh, in order to uh, reduce um, uh, cooling in the buildings, to cool off the buildings. And we also use innovative spatial solutions where we can uh, pull natural daylight far into the apartments, to the core of the apartment, and in these ways um, reduce the energy consumption of electricity, um, nudge people into a more sustainable lifestyle. So we'll also learn more about how technology um, and innovation can help retrofit our homes. And from midsummer, a Swedish manufacturer of discrete solar cell roof tiles, here is the head of corporate development, Eric Olson. Welcome. Thank you very much. Let me see some of um, your work and tell us um, about it. Yes, <clears throat> so we are the only Swedish producer of solar cells and we are producing them in Järfälla, so it's very close, uh, they're the other side of the city. And these solar panels are the most environmental friendly panels there are on the market in the world today. And they go on top of every building basically, you can uh, have in mind they are also very lightweight and also very aesthetic so they melt in into the uh, into the building design of it uh, and uh, we have sold several hundreds of them in uh, last year in sweden and the market is really there for solar right now with the high energy prices and the very much focus of being self-sustained of energy in the building so um, right now we are also, um, supplying them to, to, the, to the end market as well as selling it through resellers, roofing companies. Both residential, but also industrial building and commercial buildings, uh, which I think is equally important to, to drive down the, the carbon footprint from all of them and, and uh, becoming more uh, sustainable. Uh, and uh, that's where we, where we are today. And what's, what's most challenging for you right now? I mean, right now we can see this uh, really, really huge increase in demand of solar panels. Today, everybody buys the solar panels from China, and it's a very problematic thing to do due to forced labor, due to the high carbon emissions coming out from China, and uh, I mean, not being sustainable at all, actually. Uh, 
Then uh, the solar market just boomed due to very much the energy crisis. Everybody has suffered from the high energy bill when, when uh, and you know, cutting down your private spendings uh, of the family economy. So one thing to, 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 to do to hedge against uh, such events is to invest in solar panels. So the market has been booming the last couple of years, and especially like last year with the energy crisis. So right now it's very much scale to supply the, the very high demand. So we right now we will build a new factory. We are building one factory in, in, in Bari, south of Italy right now. And we are building, uh, doing the project engineering work for, for a large-scale factory here in Sweden. And the scaling is the big problem for us right now. But you want to keep the manufacturing in Europe? Yes, okay. yes. Europe is very, very much important. Great, yeah. thanks. We're also joined here on stage by the co-founder of Transformation um, and Innovation Consultancy, Kaizen. Studios. She was previously the head of Electrolux Innovation Hub, where she explored how we live and eat in the future. Here is Tove Chevalier. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, so yes, so I head up a studio called Kassan Studio, and we help companies to really look at sustainability from a growth and value perspective. Sorry, have to learn with the mic. Uh, so how we turn sustainability from being a, a cost structure and cost driver to actually becoming a, a growth driver. Um, so we help companies to explore how you look into future growth uh, as well as how you transform your products and innovation strategies as well as to explore new types of products. Uh, so one of the, the products uh, in my previous role that we looked into is actually the future of the, the kitchen and how we can help not only from a sustainability product perspective, but also how we enable its user to be sustainable in the way they eat. So how we help them to eat more diverse, uh, limit their food waste, uh, but also eat more plant-based. And I think that's a very kind of interesting way to look at it and how we not only work with, with sustainability from, from a, a material perspective, but actually how we help and nudge people to, to become much more uh, sustainable in the way they live. Tell us what we see in this kitchen. Yes, so this is the, the future kitchen concept. Uh, it's called Gru, which is to sprout in Swedish. Uh, and it's really kind of looking into both kind of the, the future design of the home. So we really kind of took into kind of how people both before and after COVID use their homes. And it becomes much more a place of, of living, working, socializing and everything in between. Uh, but we also looked into the barriers of eating. So what are the biggest barriers of eating more sustainable? Which is, of course, that it's difficult to do. Uh, you know, I, I'm stressed. I need to feed my kids. Uh, I, I don't like the taste or I worry it's not going to be as nutritious. Um, so we really kind of took that into the design exploration and explored, like, how can we make it as easy as possible and as part of your everyday life and also be something that is attractive and desirable? And I also know that you're looking a lot into how um, the user behavior can generate data and how that data can help predict future behavior. Yes, very much. So the biggest thing here and what we talked a lot about smart homes and, and kind of how, how the smart home is becoming something, I think that's the, the analogy and the story I think is shifting a little bit and where we can use data to, to really kind of nudge people and, and become the, more of the thoughtful home. Uh, and, and be something that is sustainable, not only from, from a climate perspective, but also from a, from a people perspective. We'll talk more. And our fourth panelist and host for this event is David Schill, our marketing director for Aritco at Aritco Lift. Um, thanks for having us. Thank you for uh, joining in to this session. Uh, yeah, Aritco is making lifts. Uh, the main driver, I think, of, of uh, our purpose of, of making lifts is actually to make every space available for and accessible for everyone. Uh, and by drive, uh, driving that in the future, you really, really need to think in a more sustainable way. Uh, so when the lifts are then uh, uh, they are growing uh, throughout your lifespan, and they are uh, they are a, uh, are a typical thing to help you stay in your house longer and longer. Because one of our key issues is, of course, that that building industry is about thirty nine percent of the total energy waste, uh, and we need to make sure that all the buildings are possible to stay there for longer. Which means that every year, for instance, we give out this trend report, kind of trend report of different types of topics. Uh, this year it's all about the 100-year 
old home, how do we make buildings last for the next hundred years? Mm -hmm. And uh, we really would like to be a part of pushing these type of messages and, and, and build products to sustain in that future. So let's start with that end in mind, creating um, a future-proofing the built environment for the next 100 or 300 years. Um, where do you start that process? Um, I, I, I'm looking at you, Tove. What's the starting point to enable us to future-proof? Yeah, I think that's the, the holy grail, right? How, do we do, how the hell do we do this? And I think it's, it's um, first of all, I think it's, it's really important to, to kind of set your targets for it. Um, and you don't have to be so scared and kind of have the best targets there is just to kind of get started and explore, as, as David was saying, in your core products, how do you want to make them more sustainable, your operations, but also kind of your organizations. Those are the, the three key ones that you need to look in. And then I think the... The biggest shift we need to do right now is to move away from having sustainability as something on the side and it actually needs to be part of your, your core business strategy and in, in your product because otherwise you're never going to get it to work. So it's not enough to have a, someone working with sustainability. It needs to be everyone's uh, core. And then I think that what we see, the, the ones that really succeed with this is those that kind of have a, a dual approach when they work with sustainability. So they both kind of look at their, their product and business today and how they kind of transform that step by step, but also how they go into the future. So, so they really kind of explore where do we want to be in, in 10 years time and, and what are the steps we need to take to get us there. So because if you only work with your current, you will only do incremental steps and you will never kind of reach out and, and do those leaps that we need to do. So, so those are the three, really kind of set the targets, move it into your core strategy and then kind of have a, a dual approach on how you do it. It's almost like having two tempos in the organization, yes, exactly. the short term and the very long term yeah. and going up and down very much in perspective. using both mm. parts of the brain all the time. Maria, how do you and your colleagues work to meet the challenge of future proofing? What's your advice? Um, well, we look at the whole building almost as, a, you know, we try to create a well-trimmed machine somehow, um, combining um, low energy consumption materials for the facade cladding, for the internal uh, technical systems and appliances, and try to make them all work well together. Um, I think that we have to have like a, 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 a viewpoint which is so much further into the future. We, we can't just build houses that may have to be torn down in 30 or 50 years. We have to think about the, the houses and the apartments being um, lasting a lifetime of 100 years or more. And if we are to do that, then we also have to think when we plan, how are we going to retrofit them, these buildings in the future to meet future functions and demands. How often do you and your colleagues talk about, you know, people living here in 21, 23? How often do you have that 100 year perspective? Um, um, constantly, constantly, because um, we want to do sustainable solutions that um, that grow with people. So we want you know families to be able to expand and and change over time. You know, children to move out and into apartments, and we need to build that flexibility into apartments and um, buildings that we. Create. And what are the big uncertainties for you and your team in this process? Um, well, I think uh, with the race in climate change, um, pro problematics with the, the climate change. The severity of the future. Mm -hmm. The insecurities that, that come along with that. We have to think about every little aspect of that and how we plan for um, sustainable solutions, re redundant solutions that can overcome that. What would you say, Eric, um, about your products that that have de been developed re in recent years, what are the uncertainties for you in, in planning production and a, a lifetime of that, a long, really long lifetime of that product? Uh, I mean, the, the lifetime is uh, validated by a certification, uh, which is the same of all solar panels that's out on the market today. So the life time of the solar panel is around 30 years uh, on the, uh, that's what you can expect uh, them to produce uh, electricity over over the years uh, and uh, they will 
then the payback time is, is a very, very short. So, so they are profitable for, for a major part of that, that time they are on the roof. The big problem, I would say, is actually to, to um, reclaim the, 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 the production and value chain back to Sweden and back to Europe. We have had the, um, the last 30 years, all industrial com Swedish companies have moved out the production to Asia. And, uh, and now and what we want to do is, is also riding on the green transition and actually make real sustainable products uh, uh, to be able to offer the market uh, with, uh, without compromises. Uh, And uh, and uh, yeah, so this, <laughs> normally the China has always been taking the, being the production fab of the world, but now uh, uh, when sustainability is high on the agenda, that's not possible anymore. David, tell us a bit more how you're iterating on different scenarios and how you work uh, in order to secure future proofing of your products and also understanding future consumer needs. For us, it's extremely important to understand how people live in the future. And therefore, we try to interview, we try to forecast, we try to watch different types of, of trends and then compound them in reports like this, but uh, also in different types of studies. Uh, and see a little bit of, of uh, in our ways of testing different concepts on people in the future, trying to really understand what actually can fly with them for many, many years ahead. But also creating systems then that are enough, give you enough flexibility so you can change the purpose, you can change the, the possibility of use depending on your life stage and what is happening around us. Uh, because if you don't make them as flexible as possible at the same time, you're maybe redundant in 10, 15 years because the surrounding is changing you right away. How do, what does it sound like when you invite that 100-year perspective into your discussions that you and, and, and your teams have? Uh, I think uh, many times it's uh, a lot of, you know, uh, different types of small groups of people uh, already today maybe uh, picking up interesting thoughts and we do interviews and we do creation sessions uh, and out of those creation sessions internally as well as externally we, we see that wow this is how it could look like in the future but then you also throw this out to different types of, of uh, how should I say uh, people with a little bit of more creative mind. Uh, we use different universities, uh, art schools, uh, etc. And, and give them different types of challenges to bring on a lot of different information. Um, to think out of the ordinary. Think mm -hmm. out of the box. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maria, um, in an age of, of um, urban densification, how can planners ensure that uh, our homes stay safe and that our cities are fit to purpose going on? Um, well, I think we have to look also outside the buildings and, and start, you know, already there with um, implementing more green structure into the urban situations because um, we're densifying the, the cities and we have all these hardened materials. Um, we need to, you know, we, we need to use the trees to shade the playgrounds. We need to use them to shade the buildings so that we don't have to um, uh, sort of work with, uh, with reducing energy costs inside the buildings for cooling and so on. Um, we need to um, put more greenery on rooftops so that we can, you know, keep these questions out. They're not so common for us in Sweden. I mean, we haven't had these problems before, but with the rising energy crisis, we, we will see more and more of this in the future. Yeah, let's talk more about how we can um, both save and generate electricity. Um, do you want to start, David? Um, what are the issues here that we need to address even more? I think uh, a couple of things that we need to address. Uh, first of all, it is how do uh, different appliances or different products that we have today, how will they be able to save and uh, how will they, of course, then be able to generate? Uh, and how can they, uh, the home itself, how can it actually be self-sustainable? Uh, more and more, I think uh, that is a key, key thing to, to, to drive. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, once again, I think the flexibility in the products to give them the, the, uh, the opportunity later on to actually be built on and not being just taken away and making a new one is the key to also be able to fit into the newer environment all the time. You talked about rising demand um, for your solutions. Um, what do you think we can foresee in the next 10 years in terms of offices, homes, both generating electricity and becoming more resilient? What will the, what will the development look like, do you think? I mean, we just seen the start of it. It will just continue to, it will be solar panels on more or less all buildings and combined also with greens, I would say, for the buildings that uh, I think that's a good combination. And that you can also see in the legislation of many, uh, many countries that have already started legislating that, that you have to have any of those two opportunities on new buildings and stuff like that. But also what's important is, uh, I think, to uh, in 10 years, in, in the future, if you to look at, uh, make a more of an outlook, uh, also how and when to use the electricity. So, so you are a lot smarter in, uh, I mean, the production is when the production are, and, uh, and, and then obviously you want to reduce the, the, the consumption of the energy in the house. But the next step is obviously to, 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 uh, uh, take out the, the peaks and actually even out the, the consumption and um, be more so self-sustained with the energy storage, but mostly, I would say, on the digital space where, where you can uh, steer into the, uh, the, I mean, combining the usage and the production and, and in the smartest way possible. I'm thinking about consumer behavior and how we have been sort of relying on central structures. I've never thought about how I will store electricity, how I will plan. How is consumer behavior changing in terms of being more innovative and also, I mean, they're being their own little power plant yeah. in, a, in a building or a, or a, or a villa? Uh, yeah. And how do you expect that to change I over mean, time? I mean, you have already seen uh, the, that going from the very much uh, the, the home electrician, uh, very early adapter, it was old guys who, who, who knew, knew anything about everything about electronics and they wanted to, and had a lot of money so they could invest in those quite expensive solar panels in, uh, in the early days. But then when it turns into a mass market, uh, and then they came the environmentalists who, who wanted to do it and uh, make, make, a, make a stand, a personal brand and stand for themselves. But now I think it's a mass market and uh, more or less everybody in your, in your neighborhood ask for, for the solar panels and, and, uh, and uh, there's no political standpoint of having the, uh, the solar panels on top of the roof. It's, it's more just common sense nowadays. So, yeah. Tove, how are you reasoning and your colleagues reasoning around how we retrofit our homes in order to save and generate, generate electricity? Yeah, I think it's definitely a lot of what you said, but I think it's both looking at the individual products, of course, and how they can, can support and how they can, can support you as, as a homeowner to, so you don't have to think about it, right? So you don't have to be that, uh, that, that uh, first adopters that are really, really keen to do it. But I think the other thing that we need to do is to look at can, how can the, the products and appliances and everything that you have in home, how can they work much, much more together? than they do today. So I think that's where, where we come in and, and kind of how we can work much more collaboratively in partnerships to explore that. How do we make sure that all of these things work together so you as a homeowner, that you don't have to think about it, you don't have to, to care because I think that's the biggest barrier we know that consumers have is, I don't know, I'm not an expert in this, just help me. How so do you foresee that interconnectedness? How, who should be responsible for that? These are all, your appliances are all different brands, your elevator is one brand, your... Yes. Microwave is another. Yes, I think that's all. everything that we fear right, right now, that we have all these companies that are trying to be the, the heroes of the town and try to take this over. So I think we're still in the early eight dates of seeing who's going to be the hub, if there's going to be a hub or if it's going to be you know, a, a, a partnership around them. Um, so I think that, that jury is still out to see who's going to be the one doing it. But we know that there's so many players working on this, so we know there's going to be an answer very, very fast. Early, I used to work early in the internet um, development and back in 97, you know how we talked about the smart kitchen and how it was the fridge that was the um, conductor of everything happening in your home and w what will be the central 
sort of appliance or hub for the steering, the management, the optimization, um, the yes. data generation, do you yeah. think? Still missed a little bit, kind of that beginning of the smart thing, uh, with the first beginning of the smart homes. Uh, and I think that's the, the mind shift that we're seeing happening, that before it was all about the technology and what technology can do. Uh, and I think or now technology is becoming a little bit the enemy uh, in some senses. But I think what, what's happening is, is what we talked about before and, and much more looking into the thoughtful home and how the, the, the home is actually becoming someone that helps you. So I don't think it's, it's the product anymore. I don't think it's going to be the product that helps and it's going to be the, the hero of the time. It's going to be a collective of things. It's going to work together. Um, and it's that system thinking that we need to approach much, much more than, than kind of me being the one standing there with all the control, uh, but actually being a lot of products working together. Eric, 40, 2048, what will be most significant uh, in terms of how we live compared to today? I think we, to start with, we will have suffered a lot during the, the way we have lived in the past. So the, the, those, uh, those effects we will see coming up in the next one, uh, 25 years, I mean, and that will affect our living, uh, how the housing will be built and how, uh, I mean, of uh, the climate change that will affect us in many, many, many ways. But also, I think we have also uh, uh, really got, I mean, made a green transition. So we, we are living in a very self-sustained matter, all of us. And that kind of goes into the backbone of all the residential at the time of for 2048. So and the energy problem won't be, an, it won't be an energy problem at the time because it will be abundant and very low cost energy at the time. I'm quite sure about that. Um, and uh, with, uh, that's more or less fossil free. So I think it, we, it, at that time, we have passed the big hurdle that we're going to, uh, you know, start shooting <laughs> us through uh, the coming years here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maria, if we walk into your home in 25 years, what will be most different um, compared to today? Um, I, I think just um, that I would like to go back to that um, idea that we have always sort of replied, um, trusted a certain supply being handed down to us, like water systems has always been centralized and, and well functioning around us. And I think in the future we have to change our mindset and maybe become more self sufficient, and then um, our homes will change according to that with um, more um, um, just systems that we can manage ourselves. And, and physically, what will, be, what will look most differently? Um, well, I think it will be lush and green, you know, and that we will have a lot of more um, plantations in our, in our cities and more sort of um, provision of food within the cities. Um, and if we are to, to have that, then we need to look at water supply, we need to look at a lot of different technical aspects, how to implement that into the city so we can have urban gardening and so on. But that's an image I'm holding on to because... I think so standing positive. on a balcony, say, looking over the city landscape, it will be very much greener, but the solar panels, according to Eric, will maybe not be visible as they are today. They'll be built into the environment. What else will be different to that? I think it's very easy in this time to be kind of gloomy, to feel, you know, we have geopolitical instability, we have uncertainties, we have polarizing happening all over the world, and it's easy to kind of fall down to the trap that, whew, how are we going to get out of this? But I think we need to remember there's a lot of positive things happening in around the world. So I think what we're seeing also in these signals in kind of happening is that we have a lot of communities coming together. And uh, there's less globalization, of course, but it's much more communities around, uh, you know, your home. You're actively seeing a lot of communities that hasn't spoken to each other for a long time that is coming together, working on these plantations and, and kind of helping each other. Uh, I think that's something that we see happening. Uh, we also see some much more green inner cities, even if they're going to be even more dense. We also see a lot of kind of nature coming back. Um, I also think it's going to be that we're going to, we're going to see the, the flaws that we've had in the past and how we consume things. But I think these kind of 
I hope a lot of innovation is going to come out of this kind of crisis that we're feeling right now, that we can look back at this and kind of, that was a really hard time, but we now have a different future we're going into. David, what have we not talked so much about that we should address? Would you like to raise a few examples from the report that um, are uh, significant? Yeah, I think uh, we need to, in the report we talk a lot about different types of new technologies, new ways of, of uh, new innovations, about new material, etc. We, uh, we need to accept that this is really the future and we need to dare to change and we need to make sure that insulation by popcorn is going to happen uh, or other types of new, new thinking when it comes to, to uh, new material. Uh, it's going to be tough because it's also going to cost. But we need to also, the ones in, you know, Stockholm, Western world, uh, Europe, we are a little bit obliged to take that cost. Because if we are not taking that cost, nobody else will take that cost. So, and then we will be standing still. So I think that is one of the uh, key things that we need to see. The second thing I think is the extreme challenge in reuse and recyclability. Uh, we talk about, you know, our lift, for instance, is 95% recyclable. Yeah, but to what? Hmm? And who will take care of that? And uh, this is a huge uh, challenge for any company making products that the, the circle is not, you know, it's not finalized. There are too many gaps around this circle. Uh, so we need to think even more reusable uh, because we're not going to be able to take care of it in a recyclable way. So how can we make products that actually are then re reusable? Let's move them and have another function or add a function or to another place. So we will talk a lot more about upcycling and about valuable waste streams. Absolutely. And that will be more of a common topic that of we'll talk about when designing a product. Mm -hmm. Besides um, solar technology, um, what other types of technologies um, do we need a lot more of in order to create more sustainable living environments? I mean, one of the things from an energy perspective is, uh, I mean, more smart gadgets. So you can use the energy at the, when you really need it. Uh, I think that's uh, one technology that I really believe is crucial. Uh, also, the, another thing is energy storage. So you can store the energy in between uh, the, the production and the, and the consumption of the, of the electricity. But um, but also I think David here I mean like also designing the products uh, so they are uh, sustainable uh, so you can uh, reuse the material and and um, take them back to the production fab and, and make new products out of, out of them so they don't end up in landfills or uh, just energy recycle as we do with most materials here in here in Sweden at um, combined heat and power plants. Mm. What other smart technologies should we talk more about? I think there's a lot of them. I think, of course, uh, the big boom right now is, is AI, right? That it's exploding everywhere. And I think that's something that we need to talk much more about, like how, how do we use them in sustainability, but also in, in a thoughtful way uh, that we actually drive a, a positive progress in the world. I think that's something that, that we are exploring a lot in the home and how we can integrate that and, and become your partner uh, and really enable you to be more sustainable. So I think that's the, the key one that we're exploring right now. Because AI could help us understand behavior, predict behavior, predict maintenance, um, predict and optimize mm. water consumption, energy consumption, but we need to design it in a thought, thought, exactly. thoughtful we, we, way. We need to do it proactively. We, if, we, if we don't think about it, someone else will think about it in a different way than what we want it to be. So we need to be proactive about it. So if we meet in 25 years here at Stockholm um, Furniture Fair, the 2048 um, Stockholm Furniture Fair, what do you think will be the topic that uh, we will be discussing, Maria? Oh, um, <clears throat> I hope it will be um, how we managed all these issues with hopefully... Um, which is the most important one that um, helped us um, deal with many of the, these crises already sort of outside the build buildings um, and that we can can sort of continue with our lives the way 
we basically live them today, but in just a more sustainable um, way. So what's the most important topic from your perspective? Um, I, well, I really feel that we need to work more on the greenery right now in the cities um, and, and overlay this with, um, with the built urban dense environment that we have. So how to accelerate that um, transition to a much greener um, urban environment. What about you, David? You set the agenda for these meetings. Uh, yeah. I hope you'll be around in 25 <laughs> I, years' time. I'm not sure. <laughs> I hope I'll be around, but maybe not standing here. Yeah? Uh, I, th I think uh, one, one thing that we uh, have explored very little uh, of today, which I think will be absolutely a key, a key part for the future, and hopefully maybe that is a huge thing to talk about, that is actually how we copy the nature in how to use and their ways of using material. Yeah? Biomimicry. So, biomimicry, yeah. Uh, and biomimicry is, is so small today. Uh, you see it actually is growing in certain areas and you see certain material. But, you know, this is what has been sustainable for several th million years. Could so, we have it as yeah. the topic for the next year at least, so we don't have to wait 25 years? Uh, absolutely, and let's see if we get enough to actually do a research on biomimicry. Uh, yeah. Final question to you, um, Tove. Um, 25 years time, you'll be at the peak of your career. What will the topic we'll see. We'll see. Um, of our talk be? I think definitely, as you said, that we were standing here and said, finally, we figured it out. Um, and I think what we need to figure out, and we, what we need to think much, much more about than we do today is, is really, we talk a lot about products and how we do them more sustainable and how we make the supply chain of products better. But I think we need to look at the demand side and how we, how we move both of them together. Like, how do, we, how do we switch both us as companies, but also how do we drive demand for them? Um, I think those go very much hand in hand, and we sometimes forget about that kind of how we how we nudge people to to be more sustainable and and, and kind of increase the demand for these products. I hope we'll talk a lot more about multi generational living. Um, I think with an aging population and with increased um, problems with um, mental health, uh, we need to be closer to each other and live more closely um, in built environments that are fit for many many different kinds of needs. So that's what I hope we'll talk about. Thank you all for coming. Can you raise your hand if you gained at least one new insight or an idea that you'll be keep thinking about um, for the rest of the day or tomorrow? Thank you. So it was worthwhile gathering us here on stage today. And thank you, Arit Lift, for having us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.